Chapter Seven of The New Magdalene. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. The New Magdalene by Wilkie Collins. Chapter Seven. The Man Is Coming. You look very pale this morning, my child. Mercy sighed wearily. I am not well, she answered. The slightest noises startle me. I feel tired if only I walk across the room. Lady Janet patted her kindly on the shoulder. We must try what a change will do for you. Which shall it be, the continent or the seaside? Your ladyship is too kind to me. It is impossible to be too kind to you. Mercy started. The color flowed charmingly over her pale face oh she exclaimed impulsively say that again say it again repeated lady janet with a look of surprise yes don't think me presuming only think me vain i can't hear you say too often that you have learned to like me is it really a pleasure to you to have me in the house have i always behaved well since i have been with you the one excuse for the act of personation if excuse there could be lay in the affirmative answer to those questions it would be something surely to say of the false grace that the true grace could not have been worthier of her welcome if the true grace had been received at mablethorpe house lady janet was partly touched partly amused by the extraordinary earnestness of the appeal that had been made to her have you behaved well she repeated my dear you talk as if you were a child she laid her hand caressingly on mercy's arm and continued in a graver tone it is hardly too much to say grace that i bless the day when you first came to me i do believe i could hardly be fonder of you if you were my own daughter mercy suddenly turned her head aside so as to hide her face lady janet still touching her arm felt it tremble what is the matter with you she asked in her abrupt downright manner i am only very grateful to your ladyship that is all the words were spoken faintly in broken tones the face was still averted from lady janet's view what have i said to provoke this wondered the old lady is she in the melting mood to-day if she is now is the time to say a word for horace keeping that excellent object in view lady janet approached the delicate topic with all needful caution at starting we have got on so well together she resumed that it will not be easy for either of us to feel reconciled to a change in our lives at my age it will fall hardest on me what shall i do grace when the time comes for parting with my adopted daughter mercy started and showed her face again the traces of tears were in her eyes why should i leave you she asked in a tone of alarm surely you know exclaimed lady janet indeed i don't tell me why ask horace to tell you the last allusion was too plain to be misunderstood mercy's head drooped she began to tremble again lady janet looked at her in blank amazement is there anything wrong between horace and you she asked no you know your own heart my dear child you have surely not encouraged horace without loving him oh no and yet for the first time in their experience of each other mercy ventured to interrupt her benefactress dear lady janet she interposed gently i am in no hurry to be married there will be plenty of time in the future to talk of that you had something you wished to say to me what is it it was no easy matter to disconcert lady janet roy but that last question fairly reduced her to silence after all that had passed there sat her young companion innocent of the faintest suspicion of the subject that was to be discussed between them what are the young women of the present time made of thought the old lady utterly at a loss to know what to say next mercy waited on her side with an impenetrable patience which only aggravated the difficulties of the position 
the silence was fast threatening to bring the interview to a sudden and untimely end when the door from the library opened and a manservant bearing a little silver salver entered the room lady janet's rising sense of annoyance instantly seized on the servant as a victim what do you want she asked sharply i never rang for you a letter my lady the messenger waits for an answer the man presented his salver with a letter on it and withdrew lady janet recognized the handwriting on the address with a look of surprise excuse me my dear she said pausing with her old-fashioned courtesy before she opened the envelope mercy made the necessary acknowledgment and moved away to the other end of the room little thinking that the arrival of the letter marked a crisis in her life lady janet put on her spectacles odd that he should have come back already she said to herself as she threw the empty envelope on the table the letter contained these lines the writer of them being no other than the man who had preached in the chapel of the refuge dear aunt i am back again in london before my time my friend the rector has shortened his holiday and has resumed his duties in the country i am afraid you will blame me when you hear the reasons which have hastened his return the sooner i make confession the easier i shall feel besides i have a special object in wishing to see you as soon as possible may i follow my letter to mablethorpe house and may i present a lady to you a perfect stranger in whom i am interested pray say yes by the bearer and oblige your affectionate nephew julian gray lady janet referred again suspiciously to the sentence in the letter which alluded to the lady julian gray was her only surviving nephew the son of a favorite sister whom she had lost he would have held no very exalted position in the estimation of his aunt who regarded his views in politics and religion with the strongest aversion but for his marked resemblance to his mother this pleaded for him with the old lady aided as it was by the pride that she secretly felt in the early celebrity which the young clergyman had achieved as a writer and a preacher thanks to these mitigating circumstances and to julian's inexhaustible good humor the aunt and the nephew generally met on friendly terms apart from what she called his detestable opinions lady janet was sufficiently interested in julian to feel some curiosity about the mysterious lady mentioned in the letter had he determined to settle in life was his choice already made and if so would it prove to be a choice acceptable to the family lady janet's bright face showed signs of doubt as she asked herself that last question julian's liberal views were capable of leading him to dangerous extremes his aunt shook her head ominously as she rose from the sofa and advanced to the library door grace she said pausing and turning around i have a note to write to my nephew i shall be back directly mercy approached her from the opposite extremity of the room with an exclamation of surprise your nephew she repeated your ladyship never told me you had a nephew lady janet laughed i must have had it on the tip of my tongue to tell you over and over again she said but we have had so many things to talk about and to own the truth my nephew is not one of my favorite subjects of conversation i don't mean that i dislike him i detest his principles my dear that's all however you shall form your own opinion of him he is coming to see me to-day wait here till i return i have something more to say about horace mercy opened the library door for her closed it again and walked slowly to and fro alone in the room thinking was her mind running on lady janet's nephew no lady janet's brief allusion to her relative had not led her into alluding to him by his name mercy was still as ignorant as ever that the preacher at the refuge and the nephew of her benefactress were one and the same man her memory was busy now with the tribute which lady janet had paid to her at the outset of the interview between them it is hardly too much to say grace that i bless the day when you first came to me for the moment there was a balm for her wounded spirit in the remembrance of those words 
grace roseberry herself could surely have earned no sweeter praise than the praise that she had won the next instant she was seized with a sudden horror of her own successful fraud the sense of her degradation had never been so bitterly present to her as at that moment if she could only confess the truth if she could innocently enjoy her harmless life at mablethorpe house what a grateful happy woman she might be was it possible if she made the confession to trust to her own good conduct to plead her excuse no her calmer sense warned her that it was hopeless the place that she had won honestly won in lady janet's estimation had been obtained by a trick nothing could alter nothing could excuse that she took out her handkerchief and dashed away the useless tears that had gathered in her eyes and tried to turn her thoughts some other way what was it lady janet had said on going into the library she had said she was coming back to speak about horace mercy guessed what the object was she knew but too well what horace wanted of her how was she to meet the emergency in the name of heaven what was to be done could she let the man who loved her the man whom she loved drift blindfold into marriage with such a woman as she had been no it was her duty to warn him how could she break his heart could she lay his life waste by speaking the cruel words which might part them forever i can't tell him i won't tell him she burst out passionately the disgrace of it would kill me her varying mood changed as the words escaped her a reckless defiance of her own better nature that saddest of all the forms in which a woman's misery can express itself filled her heart with its poisoning bitterness she sat down again on the sofa with eyes that glittered and cheeks suffused with an angry red i am no worse than another woman she thought another woman might have married him for his money the next moment the miserable insufficiency of her own excuse for deceiving him showed its hollowness self-exposed she covered her face with her hands and found refuge where she had often found refuge before in the helpless resignation of despair oh that i had died before i entered this house oh that i could die and have done with it at this moment so the struggle had ended with her hundreds of times already so it ended now the door leading into the billiard room opened softly horace holmcroft had waited to hear the result of lady janet's interference in his favor until he could wait no longer he looked in cautiously ready to withdraw again unnoticed if the two were still talking together the absence of lady janet suggested that the interview had come to an end was his betrothed wife waiting alone to speak to him on his return to the room he advanced a few steps she never moved she sat heedless absorbed in her thoughts were they thoughts of him he advanced a little nearer and called to her grace she sprang to her feet with a faint cry i wish you wouldn't startle me she said irritably sinking back on the sofa any sudden alarm sets my heart beating as if it would choke me horace pleaded for pardon with a lover's humility in her present state of nervous irritation she was not to be appeased she looked away from him in silence entirely ignorant of the paroxysm of mental suffering through which she had just passed he seated himself by her side and asked her gently if she had seen lady janet she made an affirmative answer with an unreasonable impatience of tone and manner which would have warned an older and more experienced man to give her time before he spoke again horace was young and weary of the suspense that he had endured in the other room he unwisely pressed her with another question has lady janet said anything to you she turned on him angrily before he could finish the sentence you have tried to make her hurry me into marrying you she burst out i see it in your face plain as the warning was this time horace still failed to interpret it in the right way don't be angry he said good-humouredly is it so very inexcusable to ask lady janet to intercede for me i have tried to persuade you in vain my mother and my sisters have pleaded for me 
and you turn a deaf ear she could endure it no longer she stamped her foot on the door with hysterical vehemence i am weary of hearing of your mother and your sisters she broke in violently you talk of nothing else it was just possible to make one more mistake in dealing with her and horace made it he took offence on his side and rose from the sofa his mother and sisters were high authorities in his estimation they variously represented his ideal of perfection in women he withdrew to the opposite extremity of the room and administered the severest reproof that he could think of on the spur of the moment it would be well grace if you followed the example set you by my mother and my sisters he said they are not in the habit of speaking cruelly to those who love them to all appearance the rebuke failed to produce the slightest effect she seemed to be as indifferent to it as if it had not reached her ears there was a spirit in her a miserable spirit born of her own bitter experience which rose in revolt against horace's habitual glorification of the ladies of his family it sickens me she thought to herself to hear of the virtues of women who have never been tempted where is the merit of living reputably when your life is one course of prosperity and enjoyment has his mother known starvation have his sisters been left forsaken in the street it hardened her heart it almost reconciled her to deceiving him when he set his relatives up as patterns for her would he never understand that women detested having other women exhibited as examples to them she looked round at him with a sense of impatient wonder he was sitting at the luncheon table with his back turned on her and his head resting on his hand if he had attempted to rejoin her she would have repelled him if he had spoken she would have met him with a sharp reply he sat apart from her without uttering a word in a man's hands silence is the most terrible of all protests to the woman who loves him violence she can endure words she is always ready to meet by words on her side silence conquers her after a moment's hesitation mercy left the sofa and advanced submissively toward the table she had offended him and she alone was in fault how should he know it poor fellow when he innocently mortified her step by step she drew closer and closer he never looked round he never moved she laid her hand timidly on his shoulder forgive me horace she whispered in his ear i am suffering this morning i am not myself i didn't mean what i said pray forgive me there was no resisting the caressing tenderness of voice and manner which accompanied those words he looked up he took her hand she bent over him and touched his forehead with her lips am i forgiven she asked oh my darling he said if you only knew how i loved you i do know it she answered gently twining his hair around her finger and arranging it over his forehead where his hand had ruffled it they were completely absorbed in each other or they must at that moment have heard the library door open at the other end of the room lady janet had written the necessary reply to her nephew and had returned faithful to her engagement to plead the cause of horace the first object that met her view was her client pleading with conspicuous success for himself i am not wanted evidently thought the old lady she noiselessly closed the door again and left the lovers by themselves horace returned with unwise persistency to the question of the deferred marriage at the first words that he spoke she drew back directly sadly not angrily don't press me to-day she said i am not well to-day he rose and looked at her anxiously may i speak about it to-morrow yes to-morrow she returned to the sofa and changed the subject what a time lady janet is away she said what can be keeping her so long horace did his best to appear interested in the question of lady janet's prolonged absence what made her leave you he asked standing at the back of the sofa and leaning over her she went into the library to write a note to her nephew by the by who is her nephew is it possible you don't know indeed i do not you have heard of him no doubt 
said Horace. Lady Janet's nephew is a celebrated man. He paused, and stooping nearer to her, lifted a love-lock that lay over her shoulder and pressed it to his lips. Lady Janet's nephew, he resumed, is Julian Gray. She started off her seat, and looked round at him in blank, bewildered terror, as if she doubted the evidence of her own senses. Horace was completely taken by surprise. "'My dear Grace,' he exclaimed, "'what have I said or done to startle you this time?' She held up her hand for silence. "'Lady Janet's nephew is Julian Gray,' she repeated, "'and I only know it now.' Horace's perplexity increased. "'My darling, now you do know it. What is there to alarm you?' he asked. There was enough to alarm the boldest woman living in such a position, and with such a temperament as hers. To her mind, the personation of Grace Roseberry had suddenly assumed a new aspect, the aspect of a fatality. It had led her blindfold to the house in which she and the preacher at the refuge were to meet. He was coming, the man who had reached her inmost heart, who had influenced her whole life. Was the day of reckoning coming with him? "'Don't notice me,' she said faintly. "'I have been ill all the morning. "'You saw it yourself when you came in here. "'Even the sound of your voice alarmed me. "'I shall be better directly. "'I am afraid I startled you.' "'My dear Grace, it almost looked as if you were terrified "'at the sound of Julian's name. "'He is a public celebrity, I know, "'and I have seen ladies start and stare at him when he entered a room. "'But you looked perfectly panic-stricken.' She rallied her courage by a desperate effort. She laughed, a harsh, uneasy laugh, and stopped him by putting her hand over his mouth. Absurd, she said lightly, as if Mr. Julian Gray had anything to do with my looks. I am better already. See for yourself. She looked round at him again with a ghastly gaiety, and returned, with a desperate assumption of indifference, to the subject of Lady Janet's nephew. Of course I have heard of him, she said. Do you know that he is expected here today? Don't stand there behind me. It's so hard to talk to you. Come and sit down. He obeyed, but she had not quite satisfied him yet. His face had not lost its expression of anxiety and surprise. She persisted in playing her part, determined to set at rest in him any possible suspicion that she had reasons of her own for being afraid of Julian Gray. "'Tell me about this famous man of yours,' she said, putting her arm familiarly through his arm. "'What is he like?' The caressing action and the easy tone had their effect on Horace. His face began to clear. He answered her lightly on his side. "'Prepare yourself to meet the most unclerical of clergymen,' he said. "'Julian is a lost sheep among the parsons, and a thorn in the side of his bishop. Preaches, if they ask him, in dissenters' chapels, declines to set up any pretensions to priestly authority and priestly power, goes about doing good on a plan of his own, is quite resigned never to rise to the high places in his profession, says it's rising high enough for him to be the archdeacon of the afflicted, the dean of the hungry, and the bishop of the poor. With all his oddities, as good a fellow as ever lived, immensely popular with the women. They all go to him for advice. I wish you would go, too. Mercy changed color. What do you mean? she asked sharply. Julian is famous for his powers of persuasion, said Horace, smiling. If he spoke to you, Grace, he would prevail on you to fix the day. Suppose I asked Julian to plead for me. He made the proposal in jest. Mercy's unquiet mind accepted it as addressed to her in earnest. He will do it, she thought, with a sense of indescribable terror, if I don't stop him. There is but one chance for her. The only certain way to prevent Horace from appealing to his friend was to grant what Horace wished for before his friend entered the house. She laid her hand on his shoulder. She hid the terrible anxieties that were devouring her under an assumption of coquetry, painful and pitiable to see. "'Don't talk nonsense,' she said gaily. "'What were we saying just now, before we began to speak of Mr. Julian Gray?' 
we were wondering what had become of lady janet horace replied she tapped him impatiently on the shoulder no no it was something you said before that her eyes completed what her words had left unsaid horace's arm stole around her waist i was saying that i loved you he answered in a whisper only that are you tired of hearing it she smiled charmingly are you so very much in earnest about about she stopped and looked away from him about our marriage yes it is the one dearest wish of my life really really there was a pause mercy's fingers toyed nervously with the trinkets at her watch chain when would you like it to be she said very softly with her whole attention fixed on the watch chain she had never spoken she had never looked as she spoke and looked now horace was afraid to believe in his own good fortune oh grace he exclaimed you are not trifling with me what makes you think i am trifling with you horace was innocent enough to answer her seriously you would not even let me speak of our marriage just now he said never mind what i did just now she retorted petulantly they say women are changeable it is one of the defects of the sex heaven be praised for the defects of the sex cried horace with devout sincerity do you really leave me to decide if you insist on it horace considered for a moment the subject being the law of marriage we may be married by license in a fortnight he said i fix this day fortnight she held up her hands in protest why not my lawyer is ready there are no preparations to make you said when you accepted me that it was to be a private marriage mercy was obliged to own that she had certainly said that we might be married at once if the law would only let us this day fortnight say yes he drew her closer to him there was a pause the mask of coquetry badly worn from the first dropped from her her sad gray eyes rested compassionately on his eager face don't look so serious he said only one little word grace only yes she sighed and said it he kissed her passionately it was only by a resolute effort that she released herself leave me she said faintly pray leave me by myself she was in earnest strangely in earnest she was trembling from head to foot horace rose to leave her i will find lady janet he said i long to show the dear old lady that i have recovered my spirits and to tell her why he turned round at the library door you won't go away you will let me see you again when you are more composed i will wait here said mercy satisfied with that reply he left the room her hands dropped on her lap her head sank back wearily on the cushions at the head of the sofa there was a dazed sensation in her her mind felt stunned she wondered vacantly whether she was awake or dreaming had she really said the word which pledged her to marry horace holmcroft in a fortnight a fortnight something might happen in that time to prevent it she might find her way in a fortnight out of the terrible position in which she stood anyway come what might of it she had chosen the preferable alternative to a private interview with julian gray she raised herself from her recumbent position with a start as the idea of the interview dismissed for the last few minutes possessed itself again of her mind her excited imagination figured julian gray as present in the room at that moment speaking to her as horace had proposed she saw him seated close at her side this man who had shaken her to the soul when he was in the pulpit and when she was listening to him unseen at the other end of the chapel she saw him close by her looking her searchingly in the face seeing her shameful secret in her eyes hearing it in her voice feeling it in her trembling hands forcing it out of her word by word till she fell prostrate at his feet with the confession of the fraud her head dropped again on the cushions she hid her face in horror of the scene which her excited fancy had conjured up even now when she had made that dreaded interview needless could she feel sure meeting him only on the most distant terms 
of not betraying herself she could not feel sure something in her shuddered and shrank at the bare idea of finding herself in the same room with him she felt it she knew it her guilty conscience owned and feared its master in julian gray the minutes passed the violence of her agitation began to tell physically on her weakened frame she found herself crying silently without knowing why a weight was on her head a weariness was in all her limbs she sank lower on the cushions her eyes closed the monotonous ticking of the clock on the mantelpiece grew drowsily fainter and fainter on her ear little by little she dropped into slumber slumber so light that she started when a morsel of coal fell into the grate or when the birds chirped and twittered in their aviary in the winter garden lady janet and horace came in she was faintly conscious of persons in the room after an interval she opened her eyes and half rose to speak to them the room was empty again they had stolen out softly and left her to repose her eyes closed once more she dropped back into slumber and from slumber in the favoring warmth and quiet of the place into deep and dreamless sleep end of chapter seven recording by warren cotty gurney illinois chapter eight of the new magdalen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the new magdalen by wilkie collins chapter eight the man appears after an interval of rest mercy was aroused by the shutting of a glass door at the far end of the conservatory this door leading into the garden was used only by the inmates of the house or by old friends privileged to enter the reception room by that way assuming that horace or lady janet was returning to the dining room mercy raised herself a little on the sofa and listened the voice of one of the manservants caught her ear it was answered by another voice which instantly set her trembling in every limb she started up and listened again in speechless terror yes there was no mistaking it the voice that was answering the servant was the unforgotten voice which she had heard at the refuge the visitor who had come in by the glass door was julian gray his rapid footsteps advanced nearer and nearer to the dining room she recovered herself sufficiently to hurry to the library door her hand shook so that she failed at first to open it she had just succeeded when she heard him again speaking to her pray don't run away i am nothing very formidable only lady janet's nephew julian gray she turned slowly spellbound by his voice and confronted him in silence he was standing hat in hand at the entrance to the conservatory dressed in black and wearing a white cravat but with a studious avoidance of anything specially clerical in the make and form of his clothes young as he was there were marks of care already on his face and the hair was prematurely thin and scanty over his forehead his slight active figure was of no more than the middle height his complexion was pale the lower part of his face without a beard or whiskers was in no way remarkable an average observer would have passed him by without notice but for his eyes these alone made a marked man of him the unusual size of the orbits in which they were set was enough of itself to attract attention it gave a grandeur to his head which the head broad and firm as it was did not possess as to the eyes themselves the soft lustrous brightness of them defied analysis no two people could agree about their color divided opinion declared alternately that they were dark gray or black painters had tried to reproduce them and had given up the effort in despair of seizing any one expression in the bewildering variety of expressions which they presented to view they were eyes that could charm at one moment and terrify at another eyes that could set people laughing or crying almost at will in action and in repose they were irresistible alike when they first descried Mercy running to the door, they brightened gaily with the merriment of a child. When she turned and faced him, they changed instantly, softening and glowing as they mutely owned the interest and the admiration which the first sight of her had roused in him. His tone and manner altered at the same time. He addressed her with the deepest respect when he spoke his next words. "'Let me entreat you to favor me by resuming your seat,' 
he said, and let me ask your pardon if I have thoughtlessly intruded on you. He paused, waiting for her reply before he advanced into the room. Still spellbound by his voice, she recovered self-control enough to bow to him and to resume her place on the sofa. It was impossible to leave him now. After looking at her for a moment, he entered the room without speaking to her again. She was beginning to perplex as well as to interest him. No common sorrow, he thought, has set its mark on that woman's face. No common heart beats in that woman's breast. Who can she be? Mercy rallied her courage and forced herself to speak to him. A Lady Janet is in the library, I believe, she said timidly. Shall I tell her you are here? Don't disturb Lady Janet, and don't disturb yourself. With that answer, he approached the luncheon table, delicately giving her time to feel more at her ease. He took up what Horace had left of the bottle of claret and poured it into a glass. My aunt's claret shall represent my aunt for the present, he said, smiling as he turned towards her once more. I have had a long walk, and I may venture to help myself in this house without invitation. Is it useless to offer you anything? Mercy made the necessary reply. She was beginning, already, after her remarkable experience of him, to wonder at his easy manners and his light way of talking. He emptied his glass with the air of a man who thoroughly understood and enjoyed good wine. "'My aunt's claret is worthy of my aunt,' he said with comic gravity as he set down the glass. "'Both are the genuine products of nature.' He seated himself at the table, and looked critically at the different dishes left on it. One dish especially attracted his attention. "'What is this?' he went on. "'A French pie. It seems grossly unfair to taste French wine, and to pass over French pie without notice.' He took up a knife and fork, and enjoyed the pie as critically as he had enjoyed the wine. "'Worthy of the great nation!' he exclaimed with enthusiasm. "'Vive la France!' Mercy listened and looked, in inexpressible astonishment. He was utterly unlike the picture which her fancy had drawn of him in everyday life. Take off his white cravat, and nobody would have discovered that this famous preacher was a clergyman. He helped himself to another plateful of the pie, and spoke more directly to Mercy, alternately eating and talking as composedly and pleasantly as if they had known each other for years. "'I came here by way of Kensington Gardens,' he said. "'For some time past I have been living in a flat, ugly, barren agricultural district. "'You can't think how pleasant I found the picture presented by the gardens as a contrast. "'The ladies in their rich winter dresses, the smart nursery maids, the lovely children, "'the ever-moving crowd skating on the ice of the round pond. "'It was all so exhilarating after what I had been used to "'that I actually caught myself whistling as I walked through the brilliant scene.' In my time, boys used always to whistle when they were in good spirits, and I have not got over the habit yet. Who do you think I met when I was in full song? As well as her amazement would let her, Mercy excused herself from guessing. She had never in all her life before spoken to any living being so confusedly and so unintelligibly as she now spoke to Julian Gray. He went on more gaily than ever, without appearing to notice the effect that he had produced on her. Whom did I meet? he repeated, when I was in full song, my bishop. If I had been whistling a sacred melody, his lordship might perhaps have excused my vulgarity out of a consideration for my music. Unfortunately, the composition I was executing at the moment, I am one of the loudest of living whistlers, was Verdi, La Donna Immobile, familiar no doubt to his lordship on the street organs. He recognized the tune, poor man, and when I took off my hat to him, he looked the other way. Strange, in a world that is bursting with sin and sorrow, to treat such a trifle seriously as a cheerful clergyman whistling a tune. He pushed away his plate as he said the last words, and went on simply and earnestly in an altered tone. I have never been able, he said, to see why we should assert ourselves among other men as belonging to a particular caste, and as being forbidden, in any harmless thing, to do as other people do. The disciplines of old set us no such example. They were wiser and better than we are. I venture to say that one of the worst obstacles in the way of our doing good among our fellow creatures is raised by the mere assumption of the clerical manner and the clerical voice. For my part, I set up no claim to be more sacred and more reverend than any other Christian man who does what good he can. He glanced brightly at Mercy, looking at him in helpless perplexity. The spirit of fun took possession of him again. "'Are you a radical?' he asked, with a humorous twinkle in his large, lustrous eyes. "'I am.' 
Mercy tried hard to understand him, and tried in vain. Could this be the preacher whose words had charmed, purified, ennobled her? Was this the man whose sermons had drawn tears from women about her whom she knew to be shameless and hardened in crime? Yes! The eyes that now rested on her humorously were the beautiful eyes which had once looked into her soul. The voice that had just addressed a jesting question to her was the deep and mellow voice which had once thrilled her to the heart. In the pulpit he was an angel of mercy. Out of the pulpit... He was a boy let loose from school. Don't let me startle you, he said, good-naturedly, noticing her confusion. Public opinion has called me by harder names than the name of Radical. I have been spending my time lately, as I told you just now, in an agricultural district. My business there was to perform the duty for the rector of the place, who wanted a holiday. How do you think the experiment has ended? The squire of the parish calls me a communist. The farmers denounce me as an incendiary. My friend the rector has been recalled in a hurry, and I have now the honor of speaking to you in the character of a banished man who has made a respectable neighborhood too hot to hold him. With that frank avowal he left the luncheon table and took a chair near Mercy. You will naturally be nervous, he went on, to know what my offense was. Do you understand political economy and the laws of supply and demand? Mercy owned that she did not understand them. No more do I, in a Christian country, he said. That was my offense. You shall hear my confession, just as my aunt will hear it, in two words. He paused for a little while. His variable manner changed again. Mercy, shyly looking at him, saw a new expression in his eyes, an expression which recalled her first remembrance of him as nothing had recalled it yet. I had no idea, he resumed, of what the life of a farm laborer really was in some parts of England, until I undertook the rector's duties. Never before had I seen such dire wretchedness as I saw in the cottages. Never before had I met with such noble patience under suffering as I found among the people. The martyrs of old could endure and die. I asked myself if they could endure and live like the martyrs whom I saw round me. Live, week after week, month after month, year after year, on the brink of starvation. Live and see their pining children growing up round them to work and want in their turn. Live with the poor man's parish prison to look to as the end, when hunger and labor have done their worst. Was God's beautiful earth made to hold such misery as this? I can hardly think of it, I can hardly speak of it, even now, with dry eyes. His head sank on his breast. He waited, mastering his emotions before he spoke again. Now, at last, she knew him once more. Now he was the man, indeed, whom she had expected to see. Unconsciously she sat listening with her eyes fixed on his face, with his heart hanging on his words in the very attitude of the bygone day when she had heard him for the first time. I did all I could to plead for the helpless ones, he resumed. I went round among the holders of the land to say a word for the tillers of the land. These patient people don't want much, I said. In the name of Christ, give them enough to live on. Political economy shrieked at the horrid proposal. The laws of supply and demand veiled their majestic faces in dismay. Starvation wages were the right wages, I was told. And why? Because the laborer was obliged to accept them. I determined, so far as one man could do it, that the laborer should not be obliged to accept them. I collected my own resources, I wrote to my friends, and I removed some of the poor fellows to parts of England where their work was better paid. Such was the conduct which made the neighborhood too hot to hold me. So let it be. I mean to go on. I am known in London. I can raise subscriptions. The vile laws of supply and demand shall find labor scarce in that agricultural district, and pitiless political economy shall spend a few extra shillings on the poor, as certainly as I am that radical, communist, and incendiary, Julian Gray. He rose, making a little gesture of apology for the warmth with which he had spoken, and took a turn in the room. Fired by his enthusiasm, Mercy followed him. Her purse was in her hand when he turned and faced her. "'Pray let me offer my little tribute, such as it is,' she said eagerly. A momentary flush spread over his pale cheeks as he looked at the beautiful, compassionate face pleading with him. "'No, no,' he said, smiling. "'Although I am a parson, I don't carry the begging box everywhere.' Mercy attempted to press the purse on him. The quaint humor began to twinkle again in his eyes as he abruptly drew back from it. "'Don't tempt me,' he said. The frailest of all human creatures is a clergyman tempted by a subscription. 
Mercy persisted and conquered. She made him prove the truth of his own profound observation of clerical human nature by taking a piece of money from the purse. "'If I must take it, I must,' he remarked. "'Thank you for setting the good example. Thank you for giving the timely help. What name shall I put down on my list?' Mercy's eyes looked confusedly away from him. "'No name,' she said in a low voice. "'My subscription is anonymous.' As she replied, the library door opened. To her infinite relief, to Julian's secret disappointment, Lady Janet Roy and Horace Holmcraft entered the room together. "'Julian!' exclaimed Lady Janet, holding up her hands in astonishment. He kissed his aunt on the cheek. "'Your ladyship is looking charmingly.' He gave his hand to Horace. Horace took it and passed on to Mercy. They walked away together slowly to the other end of the room. Julian seized on the chance which left him free to speak privately to his aunt. "'I came in through the conservatory,' he said, "'and I found that young lady in the room. Who is she?' "'Are you very much interested in her?' asked Lady Janet, in her gravelly, ironical way. Julian answered in one expressive word. "'Indescribably!' Lady Janet called to Mercy to join her. "'My dear,' she said, let me formally present my nephew to you. Julian, this is Miss Grace Roseberry. She suddenly checked herself. The instant she pronounced the name, Julian started as if it were a surprise to him. What is it? she asked sharply. Nothing, he answered, bowing to Mercy with a marked absence of his former ease of manner. She returned the courtesy a little restrainedly on her side. She, too, had seen him start when Lady Janet mentioned the name by which she was known. The start meant something. What could it be? Why did he turn aside, after bowing to her, and address himself to Horace, with an absent look in his face, as if his thoughts were far away from his words? A complete change had come over him, and it dated from the moment when his aunt had pronounced the name that was not her name, the name that she had stolen. Lady Janet claimed Julian's attention, and left Horace free to return to Mercy. "'Your room is ready for you,' she said. "'You will stay here, of course.' Julian accepted the invitation, still with the air of a man whose mind was preoccupied. Instead of looking at his aunt when he made his reply, he looked round at Mercy with a troubled curiosity in his face, very strange to see. Lady Janet tapped him impatiently on the shoulder. "'I expect people to look at me when people speak to me,' she said. "'What are you staring at my adopted daughter for?' "'Your adopted daughter?' Julian repeated, looking at his aunt this time, and looking very earnestly. Certainly. As Colonel Roseberry's daughter, she is connected with me by marriage already. Did you think I had picked up a foundling? Julian's face cleared. He looked relieved. I had forgotten the Colonel, he answered. Of course the young lady is related to us, as you say. Charmed, I am sure, to have satisfied you that Grace is not an impostor, said Lady Janet with satirical humility. She took Julian's arm and drew him out of hearing of Horace and Mercy. "'About that letter of yours,' she proceeded. "'There is one line in it that arouses my curiosity. "'Who is the mysterious lady whom you wish to present to me?' Julian started and changed color. "'I can't tell you now,' he said in a whisper. "'Why not?' To Lady Janet's unutterable astonishment, instead of replying, Julian looked round at her adopted daughter once more. "'What has she got to do with it?' asked the old lady, out of all patience with him. "'It is impossible for me to tell you,' he answered gravely, "'while Miss Roseberry is in the room.'" End of chapter 8 Recording by Todd Chapter 9 of The New Magdalen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The New Magdalen by Wilkie Collins Chapter 9 News from Mannheim Lady Janet's curiosity was by this time thoroughly aroused. Summoned to explain who the nameless lady mentioned in his letter could possibly be, Julian had looked at her adopted daughter. Asked next to explain what her adopted daughter had got to do with it, he had declared that he could not answer while Miss Roseberry was in the room. What did he mean, Lady Janet determined to find out? I hate all mysteries, she said to Julian, and as for secrets, I consider them to be one of the forms of ill-breeding. People in our rank of life ought to be above whispering in corners. 
If you must have your mystery, I can offer you a corner in the library. Come with me. Julian followed his aunt very reluctantly. Whatever the mystery might be, he was plainly embarrassed by being called upon to reveal it at a moment's notice. Lady Janet settled herself in her chair, prepared to question and cross-question her nephew, when an obstacle appeared at the other end of the library in the shape of a man-servant with a message. One of Lady Janet's neighbours had called by appointment to take her to the meeting of a certain committee which assembled that day. The servant announced that the neighbour, an elderly lady, was then waiting in her carriage at the door. Lady Janet's ready invention set the obstacle aside without a moment's delay. She directed the servant to show her visitor into the drawing-room, and to say that she was unexpectedly engaged, but that Miss Roseberry would see the lady immediately. She then turned to Julian and said, with her most satirical emphasis of tone and manner, "'Would it be an additional convenience if Miss Roseberry was not only out of the room before you disclose your secret, but out of the house?' Julian gravely answered, "'It may possibly be quite as well if Miss Roseberry is out of the house.' Lady Janet led the way back to the dining-room. "'My dear Grace,' she said, "'you looked flushed and feverish when I saw you asleep on the sofa a little while since. "'It will do you no harm to have a drive in the fresh air. "'Our friend has called to take me to the committee meeting. "'I have sent to tell her that I am engaged, "'and I shall be much obliged if you will go in my place.' "'Mercy looked a little alarmed. "'Does your ladyship mean the committee meeting of the Samaritan Convalescent Home?' The members, as I understand it, are to decide today which of the plans for the new building they are to adopt. I cannot surely presume to vote in your place. You can vote, my dear child, as well as I can, replied the old lady. Architecture is one of the lost arts. You know nothing about it. I know nothing about it. The architects themselves know nothing about it. One plan is no doubt just as bad as the other. Vote as I should vote, with the majority. Or as poor dear Dr. Johnson said, "'Shout with the loudest mob. "'Away with you, and don't keep the committee waiting.' "'Horace hastened to open the door for mercy. "'How long shall you be away?' he whispered confidentially. "'I had a thousand things to say to you, and they have interrupted us. "'I shall be back in an hour. "'We shall have the room to ourselves by that time. "'Come here when you return. "'You will find me waiting for you.' "'Mercy pressed his hand significantly and went out. "'Lady Janet turned to Julian.' who had thus far remained in the background, still, to all appearance, as unwilling as ever to enlighten his aunt. "'Well,' she said, "'what is tying your tongue now? Grace is out of the room. Why won't you begin? Is Horace in the way?' "'Not in the least. I am only a little uneasy. Uneasy about what?' "'I am afraid you have put that charming creature to some inconvenience in sending her away just at this time.' Horace looked up suddenly, with a flush on his face. "'When you say that charming creature,' he asked sharply, "'I suppose you mean Miss Roseberry?' "'Certainly,' answered Julian. "'Why not?' Lady Janet interposed. "'Gently, Julian,' she said. "'Grace has only been introduced to you hitherto "'in the character of my adopted daughter. "'And it seems to be a high time,' Horace added haughtily, "'that I should present her next in the character of my engaged wife.' Julian looked at Horace as if he could hardly credit the evidence of his own ears. "'Your wife!' he exclaimed with an irrepressible outburst of disappointment and surprise. "'Yes, my wife,' returned Horace. "'We are to be married in a fortnight. "'May I ask,' he added, with angry humility, "'if you disapprove of the marriage?' Lady Janet interposed once more. "'Nonsense, Horace,' she said. "'Julian congratulates you, of course.' Julian coldly and absently echoed the words, "'Oh, yes, I congratulate you, of course.' Lady Janet returned to the main object of the interview. "'Now we thoroughly understand one another,' she said. "'Let us speak of a lady who has dropped out of the conversation for the last minute or two. "'I mean, Julian, the mysterious lady of your letter. "'We are alone as you desired. "'Lift the veil, my reverend nephew, which hides her from mortal eyes. "'Blush if you like, and can. "'Is she the future Mrs. Julian Gray?' "'She is a perfect stranger to me,' Julian answered quietly. "'A perfect stranger? "'You wrote me word you were interested in her.' "'I am interested in her, and what is more, you are interested in her, too.' Lady Janet's fingers drummed impatiently on the table. "'Have I not warned you, Julian, that I hate mysteries? Will you, or will you not, explain yourself?' Before it was possible to answer, Horace rose from his chair. "'Perhaps I am in the way,' he said. Julian signed to him to sit down again. "'I have already told Lady Janet that you are not in the way,' he answered. "'I now tell you—' 
as Miss Roseberry's future husband, that you too have an interest in hearing what I have to say. Horace resumed his seat with an air of suspicious surprise. Julian addressed himself to Lady Janet. You have often heard me speak, he began, of my old friend and schoolfellow, John Cressingham. Yes, the English consul at Mannheim. The same. When I returned from the country, I found among my other letters a long letter from the consul. I have brought it with me, and I propose to read certain passages from it, which tell a very strange story more plainly and more credibly than I can tell it in my own words. Will it be very long? inquired Lady Janet looking with alarm at the closely written sheets of paper which her nephew spread open before him. Horace followed with a question on his side. "'Are you sure I am interested in it?' he asked. "'The consul at Mannheim is a total stranger to me.' "'I answer for it,' replied Julian gravely. "'Neither my aunt's patience nor yours, Horace, will be thrown away if you will favour me by listening attentively to what I am about to read.' With those words he began his first extract from the consul's letter. My memory is a bad one for dates, but full three months must have passed since information was sent to me of an English patient received at the hospital here, whose case I, as English consul, might feel an interest in investigating. I went the same day to the hospital and was taken to the bedside. The patient was a woman, young, and when in health I should think very pretty. When I first saw her she looked to my uninstructed eye like a dead woman. I noticed that her head had a bandage over it, and I asked what was the nature of the injury that she had received. The answer informed me that the poor creature had been present, nobody knew why or wherefore, at a skirmish or night attack between the Germans and the French, and that the injury to her head had been inflicted by a fragment of a German shell. Horace, thus far leaning back carelessly in his chair, suddenly raised himself and exclaimed, "'Good heavens! Can this be the woman I saw laid out for dead in the French cottage?' "'It is impossible for me to say,' replied Julian." Listen to the rest of it. The consul's letter may answer your question. He went on with his reading. The wounded woman had been reported dead, and had been left by the French in their retreat, at the time when the German forces took possession of the enemy's position. She was found on a bed in a cottage by the director of the German ambulance. Ignatius Wetzel, cried Horace. Ignatius Wetzel, repeated Julian, looking at the letter. It is the same, said Horace. Lady Janet, we are really interested in this. You remember my telling you how I first met with Grace? And you have heard more about it since, no doubt, from Grace herself. She has a horror of referring to that part of her journey home, replied Lady Janet. She mentioned her having been stopped on the frontier, and her finding herself accidentally in the company of another Englishwoman, a perfect stranger to her. I naturally asked questions on my side, and was shocked to hear that she had seen the woman killed by a German shell, almost close at her side. Neither she nor I have had any relish for returning to the subject since. You are quite right, Julian, to avoid speaking of it while she was in the room. I understand it all now. Grace, I suppose, mentioned my name to her fellow traveller. The woman is, no doubt, in want of assistance. And she applies to me through you. I will help her, but she must not come here until I have prepared Grace for seeing her again, a living woman. For the present there is no reason why they should meet." "'I am not sure about that,' said Julian, in low tones, without looking up at his aunt. "'What do you mean? Is the mystery not at an end yet? The mystery has not even begun yet. Let my friend the consul proceed.' Julian returned for the second time to his extract from the letter. After a careful examination of the supposed corpse, the German surgeon arrived at the conclusion that a case of suspended animation had, in the hurry of the French retreat, been mistaken for a case of death. Feeling a professional interest in the subject, he decided on putting his opinion to the test. He operated on the patient with complete success. After performing the operation, he kept her for some days under his own care, and then transferred her to the nearest hospital, the hospital at Mannheim. He was obliged to return to his duties as army surgeon, and he left his patient in the condition in which I saw her, insensible on the bed. Neither he nor the hospital authorities knew anything whatever about the woman, no papers were found on her. All the doctors could do when I asked them for information, with a view to communicating with her friends, was to show me her linen marked with her name. I left the hospital after taking down the name in my pocket-book. It was Mercy Merrick. Lady Janet produced her pocket-book. Let me take the name down, too, she said. I never heard it before, and I might otherwise forget it. 
Go on, Julian. Julian advanced to his second extract from the consul's letter. Under these circumstances, I could only wait to hear from the hospital when the patient was sufficiently recovered to be able to speak to me. Some weeks passed without my receiving any communication from the doctors. On calling to make inquiries, I was informed that fever had set in, and that the poor creature's condition now alternated between exhaustion and delirium. In her delirious moments, the name of your aunt Lady Janet Roy frequently escaped her. Otherwise, her wanderings were, for the most part, quite unintelligible to the people at her bedside. I thought once or twice of writing to you, and of begging you to speak to Lady Janet, but as the doctors informed me that the chances of life or death were at this time almost equally balanced, I decided to wait until time should determine whether it was necessary to trouble you or not. "'You know best, Julian,' said Lady Janet, "'but I own I don't quite see in what way I am interested in this part of the story.' "'Just what I was going to say,' added Horace. "'It is very sad, no doubt. "'Well, what have we to do with it?' "'Let me read my third extract,' Julian answered, "'and you will see.' He turned to the third extract and read as follows. "'At last I received a message from the hospital "'informing me that Mercy Merrick was out of danger "'and that she was capable, though still very weak, "'of answering any questions which I might think it desirable to put to her.' On reaching the hospital, I was requested, rather to my surprise, to pay my first visit to the head physician in his private room. I think it right, said this gentleman, to warn you, before you see the patient, to be very careful how you speak to her, and not to irritate her by showing any surprise or expressing any doubts if she talks to you in an extravagant manner. We differ in opinion about her here. Some of us, myself among the number, doubt whether the recovery of her mind has accompanied the recovery of her bodily powers. Without pronouncing her to be mad, she is perfectly gentle and harmless. We are, nevertheless, of opinion that she is suffering under a species of insane delusion. Bear in mind the caution which I have given you, and now go and judge for yourself. I obeyed in some little perplexity and surprise. The sufferer, when I approached her bed, looked sadly weak and worn, but, so far as I could judge, seemed to be in full possession of herself. Her tone and manner were unquestionably the tone and manner of a lady. After briefly introducing myself, I assured her that I should be glad, both officially and personally, if I could be of any assistance to her. In saying these trifling words, I happened to address her by the name I had seen marked on her clothes. The instant the words Miss Merrick passed my lips, a wild, vindictive expression appeared in her eyes. She exclaimed angrily, "'Don't call me by that hateful name. It's not my name.' All the people here persecute me by calling me Mercy Merrick, and when I am angry with them they show me the clothes. Say what I may, they persist in believing they are my clothes. Don't you do the same, if you want to be friends with me. Remembering what the physician had said to me, I made the necessary excuses and succeeded in soothing her. Without reverting to the irritating topic of the name, I merely inquired what her plans were, and assured her that she might command my services if she required them. "'Why do you want to know what my plans are?' she asked suspiciously. I reminded her in reply that I held the position of English consul, and that my object was, if possible, to be of some assistance to her. "'You can be of the greatest assistance to me,' she said eagerly. "'Fine, Mercy Merrick!' I saw the vindictive look come back into her eyes, and an angry flush rising on her white cheeks. Abstaining from showing any surprise, I asked her who Mercy Merrick was." "'A vile woman by her own confession,' was the quick reply. "'How am I to find her?' I inquired next. "'Look for a woman in a black dress, with a red Geneva cross on her shoulder. "'She is a nurse in the French ambulance. "'What has she done? "'I have lost my papers. "'I have lost my own clothes. "'Mercy Merrick has taken them.' "'How do you know that Mercy Merrick has taken them? "'Nobody else could have taken them. "'That's how I know it. "'Do you believe me or not?' "'She was beginning to excite herself again.' I assured her that I would at once send to make inquiries after Mercy Merrick. She turned round, contented on the pillow. "'There's a good man,' she said. "'Come back and tell me when you have caught her.' Such was my first interview with the English patient at the hospital at Mannheim. It is needless to say that I doubted the existence of the absent person described as a nurse. However, it was possible to make inquiries by applying to the surgeon, Ignatius Wetzel, whose whereabouts was known to his friends in Mannheim. I wrote to him and received his answer in due time. After the night attack of the Germans had made them masters of the French position, he had entered the cottage occupied by the French ambulance. 
He had found the wounded Frenchman left behind, but had seen no such person in attendance on them as the nurse in the black dress with the red cross on her shoulder. The only living woman in the place was a young English lady in a grey travelling cloak, who had been stopped on the frontier, and who was forwarded on her way home by the war correspondent of an English journal. "'That was Grace,' said Lady Janet. "'And I was the war correspondent,' added Horace. "'A few words more,' said Julian, "'and you will understand my object in claiming your attention.' He returned to the letter for the last time, and concluded his extracts from it as follows. Instead of attending at the hospital myself, I communicated by letter the failure of my attempt to discover the missing nurse. For some little time afterward, I heard no more of the sick woman, whom I shall still call Mercy Merrick. It was only yesterday that I received another summons to visit the patient. She had by this time sufficiently recovered to claim her discharge, and she had announced her intention of returning forthwith to England. The head physician, feeling a sense of responsibility, had sent for me. It was impossible to detain her on the ground that she was not fit to be trusted by herself at large, in consequence of the difference of opinion among the doctors on the case. All that could be done was to give me due notice, and to leave the matter in my hands. On seeing her for the second time, I found her sullen and reserved. She openly attributed my inability to find the nurse to want of zeal for her interests on my part. I had on my side no authority whatever to detain her. I could only inquire whether she had money enough to pay her travelling expenses. Her reply informed me that the chaplain of the hospital had mentioned her forlorn situation in the town, and that the English residents had subscribed a small sum of money to enable her to return to her own country. Satisfied on this head, I asked next if she had friends to go to in England. I have one friend, she answered, who is a host in herself. "'Lady Janet Roy. "'You may imagine my surprise when I heard this. "'I found it quite useless to make any further inquiries "'as to how she came to know your aunt, "'whether your aunt expected her, and so on. "'My questions evidently offended her. "'They were received in sulky silence. "'Under these circumstances, "'well knowing that I can trust implicitly "'to your humane sympathy for misfortune, "'I have decided, after careful reflection, "'to ensure the poor creature's safety "'when she arrives in London "'by giving her a letter to you. "'You will hear what she says, "'and you will be better able to discover than I am "'whether she really has any claim on Lady Janet Roy. "'One last word of information, "'which it may be necessary to add, "'and I shall close this inordinately long letter. "'At my first interview with her, "'I abstained, as I have already told you, "'from irritating her by any inquiries "'on the subject of her name. "'On this second occasion, however, "'I decided on putting the question.' As he read those last words, Julian became aware of a sudden movement on the part of his aunt. Lady Janet had risen softly from her chair, and had passed behind him with the purpose of reading the consul's letter for herself, over her nephew's shoulder. Julian detected the action just in time to frustrate Lady Janet's intention by placing his hand over the last two lines of the letter. "'What do you do that for?' inquired his aunt sharply. "'You are welcome, Lady Janet, to read the close of the letter for yourself,' Julian replied. "'But before you do so, I am anxious to prepare you for a very great surprise. "'Compose yourself, and let me read on slowly, with your eye on me, "'until I uncover the last two words which close my friend's letter.' "'He read the end of the letter as he had proposed in these terms. "'I looked the woman straight in the face, and I said to her, "'You have denied that the name marked on your clothes which you wore when you came here was your name.' "'If you are not Mercy Merrick, who are you?' "'She answered instantly. "'My name is—' "'Julian removed his hand from the page. "'Lady Janet looked at the next two words "'and started back with a loud cry of astonishment, "'which brought Horace instantly to his feet. "'Tell me, one of you,' he cried, "'what name did she give?' "'Julian told him. "'Grace Roseberry. "'End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of the New Magdalene. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Layla Montepe. The New Magdalene by Wilkie Collins. Chapter Ten A Council of Three. For a moment, Horace stood thunderstruck, looking in blank astonishment at Lady Janet. 
his first words as soon as he had recovered himself were addressed to julian is this a joke he asked sternly if it is i for one don't see the humour of it julian pointed to the closely written pages of the consul's letter a man writes in earnest he said when he writes at such length as this the woman seriously gave the name of grace rosebury and when she left Mannheim, she travelled to england for the express purpose of presenting herself to lady janet roy he turned to his aunt you saw me start he went on when you first mentioned miss rosebury's name in my hearing now you know why he addressed himself once more to Horace. You heard me say that you, as Miss Rosebury's future husband, had an interest in being present at my interview with Lady Janet. Now you know why. This woman is plainly mad, said Lady Janet. But it is certainly a startling form of madness when one first hears of it. Of course, we must keep the matter, for the present at least, a secret from Grace. There can be no doubt, Horace agreed, that Grace must be kept in the dark in her present state of health. The servants had better be warned beforehand, in case of this adventurous or mad woman, whichever she may be, attempting to make her way into the house. It shall be done immediately, said Lady Janet. What surprises me, Julian, uh, ring the bell if you please, is that you should describe yourself in your letter as feeling an interest in this person. Julian answered without ringing the bell. I am more interested than ever, he said. Now I find that Miss Rosebury herself is your guest at Mablethorpe House. You always were perverse, Julian, as a child in your likings and dislikings. Lady Janet rejoined. Why don't you ring the bell? For one good reason, my dear aunt. I don't wish to hear you tell your servants to close the door on this friendless creature. Lady Janet cast a look at her nephew, which plainly expressed that she thought he had taken a liberty with her. You don't expect me to see the woman? she asked in a tone of cold surprise. I hope you will not refuse to see her, Julian answered quietly. I was out when she called. I must hear what she has to say. And I should infinitely prefer hearing it in your presence. When I got your reply to my letter, permitting me to present her to you, I wrote to her immediately, appointing a meeting here. Lady Janet lifted her bright black eyes in mute expostulation to the carved cupids and wreaths on the dining room ceiling. When am I to have the honour of the lady's visit? she inquired with ironical resignation. Today, answered her nephew with impenetrable patience. At what hour? Julian composedly consulted his watch. She is ten minutes after her time, he said, and put his watch back in his pocket again. At the same moment, the servant appeared and advanced to Julian, carrying a visiting card on his little silver tray. A lady to see you, sir. Julian took the card and, bowing, handed it to his aunt. Here she is, he said, just as quietly as ever. Lady Janet looked at the card and tossed it indignantly back to her nephew. Miss Rosebury, she exclaimed, printed, actually printed on her card. Julian, even my patience has its limits. I refuse to see her. The servant was still waiting. Not like a human being who took an interest in the proceedings, but, as became a perfectly bred footman, like an article of furniture, artfully constructed to come and go at the word of command. Julian gave the word of command, addressing the admirably constructed automaton by the name of James. Where is the lady now? he asked. 
in the breakfast room, sir. Leave her there, if you please, and wait outside within hearing of the bell. The legs of the furniture footman acted and took him noiselessly out of the room. Julian turned to his aunt. Forgive me, he said, for venturing to give the man his orders in your presence. I am very anxious that you should not decide hastily. Surely we ought to hear what this lady has to say. Horace dissented widely from his friend's opinion. It is an insult to Grace, he broke out warmly, to hear what she has to say. Lady Janet nodded her head in high approval. I think so too, said her ladyship, crossing her handsome old hands resolutely on her lap. Julian applied himself to answering Horace first. Pardon me, he said. I have no intention of presuming to reflect on Miss Rosebury or of bringing her into the matter at all. The consul's letter, he went on, speaking to his aunt, mentions, if you remember, that the medical authorities of Mannheim were divided in opinion on their patient's case. Some of them, the physician-in-chief being among the number, believe that the recovery of her mind has not accompanied the recovery of her body. In other words, Lady Janet remarked, a madwoman is in my house and I am expected to receive her. Don't let us exaggerate said Julian gently. It can serve no good interest in this serious matter to exaggerate anything. The consul assures us on the authority of the doctor that she is perfectly gentle and harmless. If she is really the victim of a mental delusion, the poor creature is surely an object of compassion, and she ought to be placed under proper care. Ask your own kind heart, my dear aunt, if it would not be downright cruelty to turn this forlorn woman adrift in the world without making some inquiry first. Lady Janet's inbred sense of justice admitted not overwillingly the reasonableness as well as the humanity of the view expressed in those words. There is some truth in that, Julian, she said, shifting her position uneasily in her chair and looking at Horace. Don't you think so, too? she added. I can't say I do, answered Horace, in the positive tone of a man whose obstinacy is proof against every form of appeal that can be addressed to him. The patience of Julian was firm enough to be a match for the obstinacy of Horace. At any rate, he resumed with undiminished good temper, we are all three equally interested in setting this matter at rest. I put it to you, Lady Janet, if we are not favoured at this lucky moment with the very opportunity that we want. Miss Rosebury is not only out of the room, but out of the house. If we let this chance slip, who can say what awkward accident may not happen in the course of the next few days? Let the woman come in! cried Lady Janet, deciding headlong with her customary impatience of all delay. At once, Julian, before Grace can come back, will you ring the bell this time? This time, Julian rang it. May I give the man his orders? He respectfully inquired of his aunt. Give him anything you like and have done with it, retorted the irritable old lady, getting briskly on her feet and taking a turn in the room to compose herself. The servant withdrew, with orders to show the visitor in. Horace crossed the room at the same time, apparently with the intention of leaving it by the door at the opposite end. "'You are not going away?' exclaimed Lady Janet. "'I see no use in my remaining here,' replied Horace, not very graciously. "'In that case,' retorted Lady Janet, "'remain here because I wish it.' Certainly, if you wish it. Only remember, he added more obstinately than ever, that I differ entirely from Julian's view. In my opinion, the woman has no claim on us. A passing movement of irritation escaped Julian for the first time. Don't be hard, Horace, he said sharply. All women have a claim on us. 
they had unconsciously gathered together in the heat of the little debate, turning their backs on the library door. At the last words of the reproof administered by Julian to Horace, their attention was recalled to passing events by the slight noise produced by the opening and closing of the door. With one accord, the three turned and looked in the direction from which the sounds had come. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The New Magdalene This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Layla Montepe The New Magdalene by Wilkie Collins Chapter 11 Chapter 11 The Dead Alive Just inside the door there appeared the figure of a small woman dressed in plain and poor black garments. She silently lifted her black net veil and disclosed a dull, pale, worn, weary face. The forehead was low and broad. The eyes were unusually far apart. The lower features were remarkably small and delicate. In health, as the consul at Mannheim had remarked, this woman must have possessed, if not absolute beauty, at least rare attractions peculiarly her own. As it was now, suffering, sullen, silent, self-contained suffering, had marred its beauty. Attention and even curiosity it might still arouse. Admiration or interest it could excite no longer. The small, thin, black figure stood immovably inside the door. The dull, worn, white face looked silently at the three persons in the room. The three persons in the room, on their side, stood for a moment without moving, and looked silently at the stranger on the threshold. There was something, either in the woman herself, or in the sudden and stealthy manner of her appearance in the room, which froze, as if with the touch of an invisible cold hand, the sympathies of all three. Accustomed to the world, habitually at their ease in every social emergency, they were now silenced for the first time in their lives by the first serious sense of embarrassment which they had felt since they were children in the presence of a stranger. Had the appearance of the true Grace Rosebery aroused in their minds a suspicion of the woman who had stolen her name and taken her place in the house? Not so much as the shadow of a suspicion of mercy was at the bottom of the strange sense of uneasiness which had now deprived them alike of their habitual courtesy and their habitual presence of mind. It was as practically impossible for any one of the three to doubt the identity of the adopted daughter of the house as it would be for you who read these lines to doubt the identity of the nearest and dearest relative you have in the world. Circumstances had fortified mercy behind the strongest of all natural rights, the right of first possession. Circumstances had armed her with the most irresistible of all natural forces, the force of previous association and previous habit. Not by so much as a hairbreadth was the position of the false Grace Rosebery shaken by the first appearance of the true Grace Rosebery within the doors of Maplethorpe House. Lady Janet felt suddenly repelled, without knowing why. Julian and Horace felt suddenly repelled, without knowing why. Asked to describe their own sensations at the moment, they would have shaken their heads in despair, and would have answered in those words. The vague presentiment of some misfortune to come had entered the room with the entrance of the woman in black, but it moved invisibly, and it spoke, as all presentiments speak, in the unknown tongue. A moment passed. The crackling of the fire and the ticking of the clock were the only sounds audible in the room. 
the voice of the visitor, hard, clear, and quiet, was the first voice that broke the silence. Mr. Julian Gray, she said, looking interrogatively from one of the two gentlemen to the other. Julian advanced a few steps, instantly recovering his self-possession. I am sorry I was not at home, he said, when you called with your letter from the consul. Pray take a chair. By way of setting the example, Lady Janet seated herself at some little distance, with Horace in attendance standing near. She bowed to the stranger with studious politeness, but without uttering a word, before she settled herself in her chair. I am obliged to listen to this person, thought the old lady, but I am not obliged to speak to her. That is Julian's business, not mine. Don't stand, Horace. You fidget me. Sit down. Armed beforehand in her policy of silence, Lady Janet folded her handsome hands as usual, and waited for the proceedings to begin, like a judge on the bench. "'Will you take a chair?' Julian repeated, observing that the visitor appeared neither to heed nor to hear his first words of welcome to her. At this second appeal, she spoke to him. "'Is that Lady Janet Roy?' she asked, with her eyes fixed on the mistress of the house." Julian answered and drew back to watch the result. The woman in the poor black garments changed her position for the first time. She moved slowly across the room to the place at which Lady Janet was sitting, and addressed her respectfully with perfect self-possession of manner. Her whole demeanour, from the moment when she had appeared at the door, had expressed, at once plainly and becomingly, confidence in the reception that awaited her. "'Almost the last words my father said to me on his deathbed,' she began, "'were words, madam, which told me to expect protection and kindness from you.' It was not Lady Janet's business to speak. She listened with the blandest attention. She waited with the most exasperating silence to hear more. Grace Rosebury drew back a step, not intimidated, only mortified and surprised. "'Was my father wrong?' she asked, with a simple dignity of tone and manner which forced Lady Janet to abandon her policy of silence in spite of herself. "'Who was your father?' she asked coldly. Grace Rosebury answered the question in a tone of stern surprise. "'Has the servant not given you my card?' she said. "'Don't you know my name?' "'Which of your names?' rejoined Lady Janet. I, uh, "'I don't understand, your ladyship.' "'I will make myself understood. "'You asked me if I knew your name. "'I ask you in return which name it is. "'The name on your card is Miss Rosebury.' The name marked on your clothes when you were in the hospital was Mercy Merrick. The self-possession which Grace had maintained from the moment when she had entered the dining room seemed now, for the first time, to be on the point of failing her. She turned and looked appealingly at Julian, who had thus far kept his place apart, listening attentively. Surely, she said, your friend, the consul, has told you in his letter about the mark on the clothes. Something of the girlish hesitation and timidity which had marked her demeanour at her interview with Mercy in the French cottage reappeared in her tone and manner as she spoke those words. The changes, mostly changes for the worse, wrought in her by the suffering through which she had passed since that time, were now, for the moment, effaced. All that was left of the better and simpler side of her character asserted itself in her brief appeal to Julian. She had hitherto repelled him. He began to feel a certain compassionate interest in her now. "'The consul has informed me of what you said to him,' he answered kindly. 
but if you will take my advice, I recommend you to tell your story to Lady Janet in your own words. Grace again addressed herself with submissive reluctance to Lady Janet. The clothes your ladyship speaks of, she said, were the clothes of another woman. The rain was pouring when the soldiers detained me on the frontier. I had been exposed for hours to the weather. I was wet to the skin. The clothes marked Mercy Merrick were the clothes lent to me by Mercy Merrick herself, while my own things were drying. I was struck by the shell in those clothes. I was carried away insensible in those clothes after the operation had been performed on me. Lady Janet listened to perfection and did no more. She turned confidentially to Horace and said to him in her gracefully ironical way, She is ready with her explanation. Horace answered in the same tone, A great deal too ready. Grace looked from one of them to the other. A faint flush of colour showed itself in her face for the first time. "'Am I to understand?' she asked, with proud composure. "'That you don't believe me?' Lady Janet maintained her policy of silence. She waved one hand courteously toward Julian, as if to say, "'Address your inquiries to the gentleman who introduces you.' Julian, noticing the gesture, and observing the rising colour in Grace's cheeks, interfered directly in the interests of peace. "'Lady Janet asked you a question just now,' he said. "'Lady Janet inquired who your father was.' "'My father was the late Colonel Rosebery.' Lady Janet made another confidential remark to Horace. "'Her assurance amazes me,' she exclaimed." Julian interposed before his aunt could add a word more. "'Pray let us hear her,' he said, in a tone of entreaty, which had something of the imperative in it this time. He turned to Grace. "'Have you any proof to produce?' he added, in his gentler voice, "'which will satisfy us that you are Colonel Rosebery's daughter?' Grace looked at him indignantly. "'Proof!' she repeated. Is my word not enough? Julian kept his temper perfectly. Pardon me, he rejoined. You forget that you and Lady Janet meet now for the first time. Try to put yourself in my aunt's place. How is she to know that you are the late Colonel Rosebery's daughter? Grace's head sunk on her breast. She dropped into the nearest chair. The expression of her face changed instantly from anger to discouragement. Oh, she exclaimed bitterly, if I only had the letters that have been stolen from me. Letters, asked Julian, introducing you to Lady Janet. Yes, she turned suddenly to Lady Janet. Let me tell you how I lost them, she said, in the first tones of entreaty which had escaped her yet. Lady Janet hesitated. It was not in her generous nature to resist the appeal that had just been made to her. The sympathies of Horace were far less easily reached. He lightly launched a new shaft of satire, intended for the private amusement of Lady Janet. "'Another explanation!' he exclaimed with a look of comic resignation. Julian overheard the words. His large, lustrous eyes fixed themselves on Horace with a look of unmeasured contempt. "'The least you can do,' he said sternly, "'is not to irritate her. It is so easy to irritate her.' He addressed himself again to Grace, endeavouring to help her through her difficulty in a new way. "'Never mind explaining yourself for the moment,' he said. In the absence of your letters, have you anyone in London who can speak to your identity? Grace shook her head sadly. I have no friends in London, she answered. It was impossible for Lady Janet, 
who had never in her life heard of anybody without friends in London, to pass this over without notice. "'No friends in London?' she repeated, turning to Horace. Horace shot another shaft of light satire. "'Of course not,' he rejoined. Grace saw them comparing notes. "'My friends are in Canada,' she broke out impetuously. "'Plenty of friends who could speak for me. "'If I could only bring them here!' As a place of reference mentioned in the capital city of England, Canada, there is no denying it, is open to objection on the grounds of distance. Horace was ready with another shot. Far enough off, certainly, he said. Far enough off, as you say, Lady Janet agreed. Once more Julian's inexhaustible kindness strove to obtain a hearing for the stranger, who had been confided to his care. "'A little patience, Lady Janet,' he pleaded. "'A little consideration, Horace, for a friendless woman.' "'Thank you, sir,' said Grace. "'It is very kind of you to try and help me, but it is useless. They won't even listen to me.' She attempted to rise from her chair as she pronounced the last words. Julian gently laid his hand on her shoulder, and obliged her to resume her seat. "'I will listen to you,' he said. "'You referred me just now to the consul's letter. "'The consul tells me you suspected someone of taking your papers and your clothes.' "'I don't suspect,' was the quick reply. "'I am certain. "'I tell you positively Mercy Merrick was the thief. "'She was alone with me when I was struck down by the shell.' She was the only person who knew that I had letters of introduction about me. She confessed to my face that she had been a bad woman. She had been in a prison. She had come out of a refuge. Julian stopped her there with one plain question, which threw a doubt on the whole story. The consul tells me you asked him to search for Mercy Merrick, he said. Is it not true that he caused inquiries to be made, and that no trace of any such person was to be heard of? The consul took no pains to find her, Grace answered angrily. He was, like everybody else, in a conspiracy to neglect and misjudge me. Lady Janet and Horace exchanged looks. This time it was impossible for Julian to blame them. The further the stranger's narrative advanced, the less worthy of serious attention he felt it to be. The longer she spoke, the more disadvantageously she challenged comparison with the absent woman whose name she so obstinately and so audaciously persisted in assuming as her own. "'Granting all that you have said,' Julian resumed, with a last effort of patience, "'what use could Mercy Merrick make of your letters and your clothes?' "'What use?' repeated Grace, amazed at his not seeing the position as she saw it. "'My clothes were marked with my name. "'One of my papers was a letter from my father introducing me to Lady Janet. "'A woman out of a refuge would be quite capable of presenting herself here in my place.' "'Spoken entirely at random.' spoken without so much as a fragment of evidence to support them, those last words still had their effect. They cast a reflection on Lady Janet's adopted daughter which was too outrageous to be borne. Lady Janet rose instantly. "'Give me your arm, Horace,' she said, turning to leave the room. "'I have heard enough.' Horace respectfully offered his arm. "'Your ladyship is quite right,' he answered. "'A more monstrous story never was invented.' He spoke in the warmth of his indignation, loud enough for Grace to hear him. "'What is there monstrous in it?' she asked, advancing a step toward him defiantly. Julian checked her. He too, though he had only once seen Mercy— felt an angry sense of the insult offered to the beautiful creature who had interested him at his first sight of her. 
"'Silence,' he said, speaking sternly to Grace for the first time. "'You are offending, justly offending, Lady Janet. "'You are talking worse than absurdly. "'You are talking offensively when you speak of another woman "'presenting herself here in your place.' Grace's blood was up. Stung by Julian's reproof, she turned on him a look which was almost a look of fury. "'Are you a clergyman? Are you an educated man?' she asked. "'Have you never read of cases of false personation in newspapers and books?' "'I blindly confided in Mercy Merrick before I found out what her character really was.' She left the cottage— I know it from the surgeon who brought me to life again, firmly persuaded that the shell had killed me. My papers and my clothes disappeared at the same time. Is there nothing suspicious in these circumstances? There were people at the hospital who thought them highly suspicious, people who warned me that I might find an impostor in my place. She suddenly paused. The rustling sound of a silk dress had caught her ear. Lady Janet was leaving the room, with Horace, by way of the conservatory. With a last desperate effort of resolution, Grace sprung forward and placed herself in front of them. "'One word, Lady Janet, before you turn your back on me,' she said firmly. "'One word, and I will be content. "'Has Colonel Rosebery's letter found its way to this house or not? "'If it has,' Did a woman bring it to you? Lady Janet looked, as only a great lady can look, when a person of inferior rank has presumed to fail in respect toward her. You are surely not aware, she said with icy composure, that these questions are an insult to me? And worse than an insult, Horace added warmly, to grace! The little resolute black figure, still barring the way to the conservatory, was suddenly shaken from head to foot. The woman's eyes travelled backward and forward between Lady Janet and Horace with the light of a new suspicion in them. Grace! she exclaimed. What Grace? That's my name! Lady Janet, you have got the letter! The woman is here! Lady Janet dropped Horace's arm and retraced her steps to the place at which her nephew was standing. Julian, she said, you force me for the first time in my life to remind you of the respect that is due to me in my own house. Send that woman away. Without waiting to be answered, she turned back again and once more took Horace's arm. "'Stand back, if you please,' she said quietly to Grace. Grace held her ground. "'The woman is here,' she repeated. "'Confront me with her, and then send me away, if you like.' Julian advanced and firmly took her by the arm. "'You forget what is due to Lady Janet,' he said, drawing her aside. "'You forget what is due to yourself.' With a desperate effort, Grace broke away from him and stopped Lady Janet on the threshold of the conservatory door. "'Justice!' she cried, shaking her clenched hand with hysterical frenzy in the air. I claim my right to meet that woman face to face. Where is she? Confront me with her. Confront me with her. While those wild words were pouring from her lips, the rumbling of carriage wheels became audible on the drive in front of the house. In the all-absorbing agitation of the moment, the sound of the wheels followed by the opening of the house door, passed unnoticed by the persons in the dining room. Horace's voice was still raised in angry protest against the insult offered to Lady Janet. Lady Janet herself, leaving him for the second time, was vehemently ringing the bell to summon the servants. Julian had once more taken the infuriated woman 
by the arms and was trying vainly to compose her, when the library door was opened quietly by a young lady wearing a mantle and a bonnet. Mercy Merrick, true to the appointment which she had made with Horace, entered the room. The first eyes that discovered her presence on the scene were the eyes of Grace Rosebury. Starting violently in Julian's grasp, she pointed towards the library door. Ah! Oh! she cried, with a shriek of vindictive delight. There she is! Mercy turned as the sound of the scream rang through the room, and met, resting on her in savage triumph, the living gaze of the woman whose identity she had stolen, whose body she had left laid out for dead. On the instant of that terrible discovery, with her eyes fixed helplessly on the fierce eyes that had found her, she dropped senseless on the floor. End of chapter 11 Recording by Leila Montepay